So, um, <laughs> Jesus and right. Christian's hair. <laughs> hey. Um, anyway, Alona, if you don't know Alona, Alona um, came to Northwest with me in 2010. She's Act 6 Cadre 2 to all my hey. Act 6 folks. Um, uh, shout out uh, from Tacoma, awesome friend. And now she worked, she was an education major. She taught in public school system for I five did. years. Five years. Uh, did a master's degree at UW. I'm like listening to all my friend facts. And then <laughs> she just this past year um, felt like God was calling her to help plant a church. And mm -hmm. so she is now helping lead a church in Seattle and mm -hmm. Capitol Hill, which is a mission field in of itself. Amen, and amen, so amen. Um, someone I deeply love, trust, and we get dinner once a month and talk for hours. And so I figured I'd put you all through what we do at dinner. In <laughs> but 30 only 30 minutes, minutes of in it. In 30 so. minutes. So we're talking. Talking about um, Jesus and, and today's topic is Jesus and diversity. And so um, a few years ago, just to give a little bit of context, a few years ago, I did a talk on why racism. And um, that was a real focus on like, what, do, what is racism? What does it look like in our country? Mm -hmm. And what is the gospel's call for followers of Jesus along the lines of that topic? I'm not fully gonna do that today. We'll touch on parts of that. Um, but I encourage you, it's uploaded in both the app and on every platform our podcast is available. So if you get a chance, um, go check that out. You can also go check out, we had Eugene show with us a few years ago and he also did a topic on Jesus and justice. And so all of those are in the app. Um, if you wanna go, it actually help you give a little more context. Mm -hmm. um, but today, um, our goal isn't to just deal with the, the issue of racism. We actually wanna talk about something broader and that's diversity because they're mm -hmm. not the same thing. Um, diversity, often when we talk about it, we think about um, a binary of black, white, or ethnicity or culture. Mm -hmm. But diversity also has to do with sex, men and women. And it has to do with thought. And the question isn't just like diversity in the sense of what do I look like or what's my background, but it's, it's so much more of who we are. So um, today we wanna consider what is it like to be a community of diversity? What does that mean? Um, what are problems with it in our own community, in our world? And then how do we process them with Jesus? We have 20, 31 minutes, are you ready? All right, let's do it. Here we He's go. Talk Alona. Really fast. <laughs> Here we go. We talk fast. Um, Alona, first question for you Is there a biblical precedent for diversity? Short answer yes. <laughs> Long answer. Um, yeah. Literally starting from the beginning of scripture, we see a value of all of humanity. And so we start in Genesis 1 and you have uh, the scripture that tells us that God made man in his image and this idea of a mankind as male and female. So there's already more than just the one. Uh, and throughout the entire scripture in uh, all of these moments, we see God valuing all of these people. And so in, from the Tower of Babel when it falls and we have kind of this... A uh, story that's used to talk about sending people out into the world, um, all the way to the call of Abraham, which I really love as this piece where um, God reminds Abraham that his point is not himself. Mm. Uh, and so in blessing a nation, uh, what God actually does through the story of Abraham is provides us this picture of what it looks like to actually bless the nations. And so I think that's the really important piece for us to remind ourselves uh, is that God has never been focused on one people group. He's yeah. never been focused on one uh, identifier. It has been for forever this idea of blessing the nations, bringing all of humanity back mm. to God. Yeah. And then it goes into the New Testament. I think we have a scripture in Galatians 3. You see Paul, and he looks at this issue of um, as soon as the church comes together, as soon as um, God's people are made and established, mm -hmm. the main problem that you see in almost every church in the New Testament is this question about Jew or Gentile. Mm -hmm. And often we kind of Christian, like, Christianize it and make it this like people who observe the law and people who like just want to like kind of be free from it. But it's actually really deeply a multi-ethnic issue. It's like right. how do people in a world who've never, who are so mm -hmm. homogenized of different ethnicities, Jew, Gentile, like I'm from Rome, I'm from Ephesus. You have these people now all trying to follow Jesus together and it mm -hmm. actually causes problems, which is a reason why I appreciate the scripture. It doesn't seem to like hide the problems right. in the Bible. <laughs> like if you read the Bible, there's so many problems that you're like, oh wow, this is real life. Mm -hmm. And so you see these problems in the church and Paul looks at so many churches and goes, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. There's neither slave nor free, which he's dealing with socioeconomic status mm -hmm. of people. So if you're thinking of classism, Paul's dealing with it. There's no male, male nor female. He's dealing with sex right there. Mm -hmm. Even he talks about relationships of parents and their kids. And he's saying all these different identifiers, all these different ways that we come together or we don't or we separate. Well, in Christ, there's a new unifying ethic. Mm -hmm. And even you get to the end of the, I mean, Jesus goes at it and we'll talk about that too. But you get to the end of the Bible, Revelation yeah. chapter 5, yep. Revelation chapter 21. And you see even at the very end of the scripture, the Bible talks about every creature, every tribe, every tongue, every nation coming together under the leadership and authority of Jesus. And so we see like from beginning to the end, this whole issue of like, how do people of different ethnicities, different groups, different diversities come together? It's a real clear answer in the scripture. Like, yes, they're called to in Jesus. Mm -hmm. 
The tragedy is that in our culture, most people won't say that Christianity values all of those things, mm. and there's a whole host of reasons why. But it's important for us to remember that that is what the scripture says, and it is what Jesus modeled. Yeah. Um, we pulled a quote from Confronted Christianity, which is kind of helping frame this series for you guys. Uh, and Rebecca McLaughlin, the author, says, contrary to popular conceptions, the Christian movement was multicultural and multi-ethnic from the outset. We have to remember, Jesus was a first century Middle Eastern Jew. So just, Jesus was not white and blonde. Uh, Jesus scandalized yeah. his fellow Jews by tearing through racial and cultural boundaries. And mm. again, we think about just the example, and we were chatting about this. One of my favorite stories to really think about is Jesus and the Samaritan woman. And you're thinking about that story. Like talk about we have kind of racial and cultural, and then even we're going to layer on gender in this. Uh, we have this woman that he's engaging with who as a as a Jewish teacher, should not, one, be talking to a Samaritan person, and two, as a man engaging with a woman whose story we then hear, um, that the disciples themselves, when they walk up to Jesus afterwards, are like, sorry, come again? Who are you talking to? Yeah. Uh, why are we engaging here? This feels a little confusing. And just watching the example of Jesus in Scripture models for us that we are called to engage, that there's, there's never a delineation, no matter how culturally entrenched it is, there's no line that we aren't called by the gospel to cross. 100%. I, I love, I'm like so encouraging you get this book. It's fantastic. And I love she brings up a statistic. And she asked the question, when you think of a Christian, what's the picture of a person that comes to mind? And I ask you that for a second. Like when you, when you hear, oh, that's a Christian, or you think of a Christian, what's the first face that you see? And she said, statistically speaking, in America, the first face you should see is a black woman. Mm-hmm. Like, statistically speaking, the mm -hmm. most people who are the largest group of demographics that are Christians in America are actually black women. Mm -hmm. Second of all, around the world, Globally. it's, it's yep. actually specifically women of color. Yep. So when you think you're attacking Christianity, be careful who you're attacking in the name of justice. Mm -hmm. You're actually attacking a religion that more than any other religion in human history mm -hmm. has brought people of different socioeconomic status, statuses, different um, languages, different ethnicities, different cultures, um, different sexes, all together more than any other religion in human history. Right. But at the same time, like, we also know there's been tons of issues around this topic, mm -hmm. especially even within the church. And yeah. so um, the second question, like, question, I think, is, like, let's dive into the reality that we don't fully live in that. And right. even as Christians, sometimes we don't model it. So um, what's wrong with our world in terms of diversity? Yeah, I think all of us will likely have either lived in experience or observed an interaction where we can name, mm, that's not maybe the gospel's view of what we just described for diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's important for us to remember that that's really hard. Uh, and to just think about like our own personal stories um, in thinking and preparing for today, uh, I think there's, there's a lot of layers we've mentioned, like diversity as this big idea. I think about socioeconomics for me. So my, as you can tell by my name, I'm not just American. Ilona Trofimovich is a very Russian name. <laughs> uh, and so my family immigrated from the Soviet Union to escape religious persecution, like this super cool story and legacy of our family. Um, but when I walked into a room, uh, I'm immediately just perceived, I have the privilege to be perceived as just this white woman who walks in. Uh, and nobody gets my story of coming from an immigrant family, uh, the point that I still to this day don't really speak the same language as my father because he will always prefer to speak in Russian and I will always prefer to speak in English. The layers of socioeconomics for that was that my family moved to this country with literally just their suitcases uh, and then tried to try to kind of figure it out in a world where they didn't know the system, they didn't know the language, mm. they didn't have people. They were literally fleeing for their lives from uh, the Soviet Union. And so that whole story uh, is something that nobody understands. Like people make an assumption about me at the face level and don't see the pain that it was to walk into the food bank as a kid and know that this is the only food that you have an option to pick from. Hmm. And so feeling the weight of that, that people want to make assumptions about you based on that surface level and never really take the time to get to know your story. Um, and I think in particular to that piece of being a woman, there's a lot of, I think, layers to this. And um, I was here in the fall kind of talking a little bit about kind of the complexities of being a, a woman into today's society, which is so <laughs> flaming feminist at the moment <laughs> that it's hard to try to orient yourself in a gospel way in yeah. that space. Um, but I still wrestle with the fact that as a woman working in ministry, when I walk into a meeting or into an office, the people in leadership that I see are not women. They're usually men. Um, and even the tension that this literally happened this week, um, where I walk into the, into the room and the question I'm asked is, oh, are you the secretary? 
No, I'm not the secretary. I'm actually the director of operations. So nice to meet you. And it's tricky. To I run to the church. <laughs> I, I actually nice to run meet you. everything that you're seeing right now, but I'm so happy that I'm the secretary too. And just feeling the tension, like that's real, that's mm. raw, and that's not 50 years ago. That's literally on Monday. And so we yeah. have to sit in those tensions. I mean, another story is from my own life. Um, a couple years ago, and there's a picture on the screen of it. Um, I was, uh, I wrote a post on Facebook celebrating Martin Luther King Jr. And like to maybe get more into the conversation around racism, I wrote this post, um, which is a little bit um, hard to read as it's blown up. But basically, I just kind of call the community like, hey, if we're going to celebrate Dr. King, let's consider selling, um, living into his legacy mm -hmm. more than one day a year. Let's be people that kind of bear that image and become people who like work to bring a, create a just society that's Jesus-centric. And um, one of the comments that came on my, my uh, social media was, happy nigger day. And I was like, this isn't, this is, this is 2018. And, um, and it, it was shocking, and you know, I got to just kind of write back to the person who didn't respond, and that's fine. Um, but I was just going, whoa. But the problem with that is that's kind of the picture that a lot of people think of when mm -hmm. they think of racism in society. And so when we talk about diversity, we talk about racism, you think of something like this often, and you go, well, truthfully, like, um, that's not a lot of my experience where people are doing that, or um, I don't live in an experience constantly where I'm like, blatantly like chastised sure. because of um, the color of my skin or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so what it does is it also causes, a, causes us to often believe in kind of the lie of like a post-racist society right. or like kind of a colorblind world. And that's kind of the world that I grew up in, even in my church environment a little bit is like, oh, this issue's over. Mm -hmm. And you're like, well, no, the issue isn't just about this. Because these situations for me are more few and far between. But let me tell you what's more real in my experience and it's the next picture. It's literally about, it's about assumptions. And you'll see this on the screen. Um, for example, in my role as a campus pastor here, um, I'm on the phone and I'm email a lot. I get to travel a lot for the university. I get to do music and things like that. And I can, um, and it's really such an awesome experience. But I've had so many opportunities where I'll email someone back and forth and, um, and you know, we're talking through experience, talking through the service, what's going to happen. And I show up and actually um, I can tell, and it's kind of through the way they start talking, conversing with me, you realize that they weren't expecting me to be black. And it's because, like, just the first assumption of who the campus pastor is um, wasn't going to be a black man. And the thing is, they're actually excited that I'm black. They're like, oh, he's probably going to be, like, this really exciting message, and he's probably going to wail when he sings, and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, thanks for the compliment. But, um, but at the same time, it's about the assumptions that we kind of carry, the implicit bias yeah. that we assume the way the world's going to work or how, um, what we expect out of each situation. And so you even see pictures like this on the screen where growing up, you know, I look at superheroes, and none of them look like me. Mm -hmm. So, Christian, do you not get to be super? Or like, and, but you're told, no, you can do anything you want. And so we live in this world that has these different tensions of both people who aren't, who aren't mo like typically implicitly like working against you, but you also live in a world that has a system that's not necessarily showing you that you can make it, both as a, a, a person of color, as a woman, in mm -hmm. so many different ways, socioeconomic statuses, right. um, we experience this tension. And so um, that kind of gets us to a societal level. So Alona, would you speak to maybe these problems a little bit uh, societally? Like what is our moment in our world right now around diversity? Right. And I think what probably most of us feel is that whatever the moment is, it's overwhelming mm. uh, because we live in a moment that we honestly fear saying anything wrong about diversity and what it means and who's in and who's out. And we have a lot of those pieces that feel really emotionally jarring for us. And we um, don't necessarily know kind of where we are. We don't know how to orient in that space, uh, all exacerbated by this outrage culture that mm. the moment you say anything borderline microaggression, you are now the enemy. We are going to lambast you on every social media. <laughs> You've gone viral in all the worst ways. Uh, and like you literally can have your life ruined just by kind of these small comments that we don't even necessarily always take intentionally. Mm. Um, and it's totally ingrained in us. Like I, I am a product of the society that the moment somebody makes a microaggression against a woman, I'm like, that's wrong. You can't do that. You can't do that. And I want to, because that's what kind of society tells us is appropriate, is to point out all the ways that people are wrong. Um, but that's not really the helpful response or the helpful reaction. Um, and instead, we've kind of use this diversity word as a buzzword. It's a value statement. Mm. And the moment somebody 
doesn't claim that they value diversity, then we think less of them. Yeah. Uh, and probably the worst like knock against somebody's character is for somebody to have said they don't they don't value diversity. Uh, and suddenly it's this value statement, this character statement, um, and we have judged your entire like humanness on whether or not you think diversity is a good or a bad thing. Hmm. And like, do I have the same opinion about diversity if I've mm -hmm. had the same lived experience? And truthfully, if I can kind of lovingly even speak, um, and again, again, I know these conversations can like feel intense for a moment, so like take a deep breath, a deep breath out. Um, we're not saying this is like talking as people who aren't committed to being a part of this mm -hmm. community. Like I'm naming it as a person who was a student here, who lives here, as people who I'm committed to, who I love, and even thinking for students, for white students for a moment, and people in our community who are going, I've never like even heard this before, or I've never, I, it's just not the world I've lived in. And so there, there's students who, you know, they'll walk into a situation and they'll say something that like hurts somebody else, and automatically they're, they're, just, they're just new. So they're going, oh my gosh, I, I don't know what to do mm -hmm. here. And I think even me as um, a follower of Jesus who's African American, I have to be careful not to villainize another yeah. brother or sister in Christ just because they're new to a conversation and they don't understand it even if it hurt even if it costs me like hurt and pain and pride for a moment mm -hmm. I have to go this might also be someone who I'm called to love and let them learn something new and step into that over time like mm -hmm. make a mistake more than once and right. say you know I value and love you more than even just this one moment I think the gospel forces us to have that reaction because the whole idea is again back to Genesis 1 we've all been created in the image of God and I think this is really what this issue boils down to is the us versus is them, that we want to claim that I'm a, I have this in-group, so whether that I'm going to use that for my socioeconomics, I'm going to use that for being from an immigrant family, being a woman, I'm going to use that in-group as a way to say you are other, you're the them. And so I can villainize you, I can say whatever I want about you because uh, I've made these assumptions and I've also thought about maybe assumptions that you've made about me and we use that to create these distances, these chasms between us, uh, and we don't recognize that the reaction of the gospel in those moments is to remind ourselves that that person, as hurtful as that comment might have been, as maybe I want to claim as ignorant as that comment is, mm. the gospel still calls me to engage. Uh, and if anything compels us and demands us to not uh, write off that other person, but in grace, in mercy, and in love, as we recognize how desperately needy we are, that we also would look at that other person and recognize that we have that to offer them as well. Yeah, it's difficult. And um, you read, I, I want you to read this quote, because you, oh, yeah. you would, uh, Alone and I are constantly like exchanging book ideas. <laughs> if you don't notice, I like books. And, um, Love them. and uh, you, read, you had this quote that you showed me last night or this morning. Yes. I want you to read it. Yeah, so the book is Disunity in Christ by Christina Cleveland. Uh, and she kind of unpacks this whole idea of the way that we categorize people as in or as out or as us or as them. Um, and she writes, when it comes to groups getting along or not, what we think of them is just as important as what we think they think of us. And she really points to this truth that we have kind of a baseline pessimism for what we think other people think about us. And I totally see this happen. I'm like, oh, all white men just probably think this about me and la, la, la. And I make this narrative in my head, and that's just as important as what I think about them and they're thinking about me. And it creates really unhealthy kind of cyclical patterns of engagement, and mm. it doesn't go anywhere. It's not the gospel. And it, like, goes to show, too, that a lot of our problems aren't so much diversity in and of itself, but it's, or disliking a person, mm -hmm. it's that we don't engage. Yeah. Like, from every side of this, it's like, oh, I, I, it's, it's safer and easier to not engage another person because maybe they're more complex than, like, just <laughs> the, my idea of who they are. Sure. Or maybe they're more complex than one statement. Um, pastor Brian McCormick is a uh, pastor of Reach Church, mm -hmm. and um, he made, they've been going through a similar series, and he made this really, really beautiful comment, um, and he said, he talked about the importance of reflecting on our social location. Reflect on your social location. We tend to unconsciously formulate thoughts or stereotypes within our mind about a certain group of people or a person, but we must ask ourselves one question. What about my social upbringing and location placement impacts the way I think? So where am I coming from, and how does that impact every person? Like, where Christian Dawson is an African-American man, 20 years old. What, where, where does my location, how does it cause me to see people in the world? And um, if I can maybe name some of the aches in our own community um, around this, I think there's people in our community, and I know there's people who grew up in communities that looked like them, and now they feel displaced being in a community that doesn't really look like them. There's people in our, uh, whose families, they're deeply impacted around issues like immigration, like, it's not an other. It's, that's, that's my family. That's deeply impacted by what happens around that issue. There's people who don't see people like them as the lead pastor or politician or CEO. And what does that do with the way I even approach 
my vocation and career and my calling. There's people who um, are away from home and they don't speak English as their first language in our community. And I therefore can't engage in the same way. People don't engage me in the same way. There's people who deal with generation of tra generational trauma with issues of slavery, mass incarceration, and civil rights. And so I have a lens that I come into life with and, and a burden and, and issues that I come into life with. There's people who feel like they live in a culture that is growing more hostile to them because of the color of their skin, whether it's white or black. There's people who've never had these conversations before and this isn't their lived experience and they're just trying to figure it out. And I think we have to see every one of those people, wherever you might be on the spectrum with that as, and we have to see our, our other people, those other people as fellow image bearers of God. Like, we can't see them yeah. any longer as an other. We can't see them any longer as a person who, who just doesn't get it. Who No, we have to see them first and foremost. When we talk about diversity, actually, that is the image of God. Mm -hmm. And therefore, and like you think about it too, Jesus, um, if you remember, he was talking to his disciples once. And, 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 he, and they're going, Jesus, when did we ever see you? When did we ever experience you? He goes, oh, the way you treated that other person was mm -hmm. actually the way that you treated me. And all of a sudden, we realize that our, even our issues around diversity are issues of, like, how am I going to treat Jesus himself in that other person? Yeah. What am I assuming about that person that actually does, that's making assumptions about Jesus still in certain ways? Mm -hmm. And so um, I guess the last question um, to kind of walk through and wrestle through with this whole topic is then what is the gospel's vision for diversity? I think um, if we can be a little political for a moment, um, we've made this a political issue. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it's, it automatically makes us kind of hostile to conversations because you hear, quite, like, we talk about diversity, we talk about sex, we talk about things like this, and all of a sudden, all of our triggers of, like, politics come in mind. Right. And like, oh, are you going to talk about the right? Or are you going to talk about the left? Are you voting this way or voting that way? And it's not an issue, first of all, of politics. It is an issue of the gospel. Like, right. first and foremost, mm -hmm. if you look at any time that Paul talks about sex, he talks about, he talks about diversity, multi-ethnic, anything along those issues, the first thing he says is about, it's in, you don't believe the gospel. Like, Paul in Galatians 1 and 2, he has the audacity to call out Peter. Like, bold move, right. bold move. <laughs> like, you're going to call out Peter. You're going to call the rock. You're going to call this guy. And he, he calls out Peter, who's treating Jewish Christians one way and Gentile Christians another. Mm -hmm. And what does Paul say to them? He doesn't say, oh, you're, you're doing this, you're doing that. He doesn't say, you need to fix your actions or behavior. He says, Paul, he says Peter, you're living out of step with the gospel. Right. You're living out of step with the gospel. And so, Alona, um, my question is, what is the gospel's vision for diversity? Yeah, and I think for us to kind of break down what it's not and what it is, um, hitting on that first part, like, it's not politics. And as much, I guess, as somebody who got a master's degree in educational policy, <laughs> that's kind of hard to say, because, like, it is about politics. Um, but to remember that for us, the idea is that the gospel supersedes politics. Yes. Uh, that the gospel rises above it. And so we could sit up here and offer a critique of both the right and the left yeah. and the ways that they have failed to live out a true care and concern for human dignity and the humanity of all people. Mm -hmm. um, and that applies to both sides. But it's to remind ourselves that there's something greater and more important than that. Yeah. Um, that is the thing that should define for us as Christians the response to those moments. Um, and I think as it relates to that, that kind of connects to what has also become really politicized, the, the idea of social justice mm. um, and the fact that we in our culture uh, will oftentimes want to claim that social justice is the ultimate good. Mm. And if you aren't helping or supporting or promoting a cause of social justice, then you're a bad person. Uh, and recognizing we have to kind of take a step back from that social narrative and see it for what it is um, and recognize that as much as uh, issues of social justice are good um, on a kind of public regard, they, for us as Christians, aren't actually meaningful if they aren't changing the way that we tangibly love our neighbor. Hmm. Because we can get really good at posting something on Instagram or on Facebook or whatever that, that is a virtue signaling of like, I'm going to use my buzzword of diversity and look how good I am about caring about XYZ social issues. It's like Aziz Ansari's woke points, <laughs> if you don't watch that, but it's Aziz Ansari's oh, like, he talks about that. woke points. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But it's this idea that we want to show people that we're good, but then when I'm in that really uncomfortable meeting or that person just said something to me, I don't actually love them in response. Hmm. And so it's this idea, uh, I love this, I uh, talk about books that we've read. Um, uh, there's a great book called Practices of Love that really digs into the idea that anything that we do as Christians, any spiritual practice or discipline from reading our Bible to praying, um, doesn't actually matter if it doesn't transform our love for our neighbor. Hmm. 
And I think the exact same thing is true when we talk about this idea of diversity. Because mm -hmm. I can say all I want on social media or in conversations or abstractly like this sitting on a stage. But if this doesn't change the way that I then interact when I walk into a restaurant later or I'm uh, at a gathering with people that maybe don't agree with me or I'm suddenly uh, confronted with an issue that bothers me, all of those moments, if I don't engage in that moment with love and grace and compassion, then what was the point? Yeah. Like it, it forces us as Christians to really think about the fact that this isn't just abstract. It's not just scripture in a text. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea is this is supposed to transform my heart and my yeah. posture towards people. Hmm. And then I think it even gets into like picking and choosing who my neighbor is. Ooh, yeah. Like I don't have the right, and Jesus gives such a clear parable in Luke. I don't have a right to pick and choose who my neighbor is. Mm -hmm. So like often I think of my neighbor as the person who agrees with me. Mm -hmm. And even in our world today, we, we, we like the topic of diversity until, until it becomes ideological. Mm -hmm. Essentially, I like diversity until it involves somebody who thinks differently than me. So yeah, send every person that looks different. <laughs> let's all love yeah. each other. Let's all be close. But if you think differently than me, then all of a sudden... Like, we shut it down. Right. And Jesus calls us and says to us, like, very clearly in the parable, who is your neighbor? And the whole point of that parable is I don't get to decide who my neighbor is. Right. I don't get to pick and choose who fits into the category of neighbor. And so gospel diversity is not neglecting our neighbor. Right. And the view of diversity for us as Christians is to remind ourselves that valuing this isn't going to be convenient, easy, or fun. Mm. Uh, and we can sub in the gospel for that because the gospel isn't convenient, easy, or fun <laughs> either. It takes work. And I, I think there's so much to remind ourselves. Like, we live uh, in a broken world, but there's that great um, Solzhenitsyn quote. I have a Russian. I have to quote a Russian. Uh, but there's that great quote where he talks about, like, the, the line between good and evil runs down the middle of every human heart. Mm. And to remind ourselves that the way that we have to engage a really tough issue is to remind ourselves that it's not going to be easy but yeah. that doesn't mean it's not wrong or that, that doesn't mean that we don't engage in yeah. that like we do confront issues that need to be confronted but to remind ourselves that when it gets hard it doesn't mean that we have a cop out to be like oh that's just gonna be really complicated or oof that buddy said something and I should probably say something in response but I don't really want to because like I got plans <laughs> so I gotta go <laughs> and to remind yeah. ourselves that actually we are we are compelled to engage that the gospel is a posture towards the other not away from them mm. which calls us one, the gospel is about engaging. Second mm -hmm. of all, it means the gospel is humbling. Like gospel diversity yeah. is about being, it takes like the posture of humility of saying one, and you, like I have to be a person who both is humble enough to learn and humble enough to be in a community where I can get hurt in the process. Right. And just saying, I'm not going to quit even though, even when it hurts, I'm not going to let go. I'm not going to let up. I'm not going to back out of this. I'm going to stay in it even when it costs me. Mm -hmm. And there's a nuance to that. That for those of us who have ever been slighted, we're like, yeah, 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 that's right, that's right. Like, tell that other person to make <laughs> sure that they do that. Um, I think it's sometimes hard for us to picture that we might also be the person that caused offense. Hmm. And that's, like, significantly more uncomfortable. But I think yeah. that's the other layer of humility is, like, I think we like it more when we get to be the one giving grace to somebody else because they did something <laughs> wrong. That's I'm like, so yeah, 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 I'm the better person. I'm going to forgive you for saying that. And it's yeah, different when we're the one who also needs to then engage and be humble and ask for forgiveness. Mm. Because we've had a moment where, like, I did misstep. I made an assumption. I uh, treated that person in a way that wasn't actually really valuing. And, again, this idea of diversity being across so many spectrums. So you think about the way that I live your idea of, like, the ideological piece. I think that's probably one of the biggest ones we wrestle with in society. And would I have the humility in a moment when I know that I have judged somebody for the way that they acted and engaged and whether I then kind of responded negatively to them or whatnot, would I be humble enough to own, like, hey, I just want to acknowledge that wasn't loving or kind, um, and that's not the way that I want to live my life. That's, those aren't the values that I have as a believer. And mm. so would we actually be willing to be humble in the moments when we cause offense mm. um, and not just always think that, no, oh, I've got it figured out. Yeah. I don't do that. Other people do that. Like, is that's just the same us-them binary all over again. And then I think lastly, it's the gospel diversity is about like leveraging our power, story, background, resource, et cetera, for the benefit of others. And if I can speak to the issue specifically of like racism when it comes to ethnicity or culture, um, you know, racism by definition, again, please go back and listen to the podcast. It's going to be more helpful than these two minutes. But um, racism by definition is about power and prejudice working together on a systemic level within a society. 
So, by, like, that's the academic definition. That's just not, like, Christian's thoughts. So, um, but the, by, like, an academic definition, racism is essentially, like, prejudice and power combined on a systematic institutional level. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just about disliking a person because of the way they look. It's about how a whole society operates to benefit some and to hurt others, um, which we can get into classism and stuff like that, too. But I think that's where the gospel actually has a solution. Because if racism ultimately becomes an issue about power, who has power and who does not, who has their needs met, who does not, then the solution actually, then the question, like it begs the question, what resource is there on heaven or on earth that allows people to give up their power for others? Right. Like what other resource, and this is probably my like a little bit of problem with like a lot of our, our movements around issues of like diversity and justice, they're, they're very important. But my question is, if it's about power, then like what would ever cause me to give up my power to serve somebody else at my expense? What would cause you? And I don't know if there's another resource outside of the gospel of Jesus Christ that liberates people mm -hmm. to give up power, to give up privilege, to give up story, to give up resource, to give up, back, to give up everything that we have to serve and benefit others at our own expense. Mm -hmm. Paul says it in um, Philippians chapter 3, and you'll see it on his screen. He says, have the same attitude in you as Christ Jesus. Though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but he humbled himself and became a servant. He humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. Mm -hmm. You see, Jesus, he doesn't fully, now, Jesus doesn't give up his godhood. Mm -hmm. We believe in, like, the God-man. Right. So he's fully God, but he pours his godhood into something. Mm -hmm. He uses his power, his resource. I mean, can you imagine God? God himself has submitted all of his power, all of his strength, all of his riches and wealth and might in order to serve you and I. Talk about giving up power right. for the other. Talk about giving up power for your enemy. And I don't think that's a call for us to just say, Jesus did it, I should do it too. It's a call to actually say, Jesus did that for me mm -hmm. and allow us to actually change my heart. Like we have to allow the gospel to like get so deep in us that mm -hmm. it actually changes the way we look at other people and it changes the way we view power. It actually changes us in a deep core place. And that actually, I think, is what empowers us to do that for others. Mm -hmm. Whatever your form of power it is, whatever your form of privilege is, whatever your form of background or story, whatever it might be, Jesus calls us to use all of those things for the benefit of the other. Right. And so, like, what do we do from here? Um, here's a few reflections um, or maybe applications that we can do. The first one is, if you want to learn more about this topic, again, we have a few different podcasts and talks that we've done in the past on this. Mm -hmm. Today, we can't talk about everything. So I know someone's going to email me and say, Christian, you didn't talk about this thing. <laughs> I did not talk about that thing. I am sorry. Actually, I'm not sorry. I did not talk about that thing. I made that conscious choice. Um, but we have talked about a lot of different things. And so I'd encourage you to please, as a community, yeah. could we dive more into this conversation? And would you take maybe 20, 30 minutes to listen to another podcast so we could process this more as a community? Mm -hmm. um, there's also resources on these conversations. So if you go on the app, it's under growth resources, or if you go on our website, all of that's available with tons of different podcasts, research, books are on available, recommended reading, all that sort of things. But um, there's three different things. Um, actually, go back to that last slide. I'm so sorry. You are very kind, though. Um, <laughs> there's three different things. Alona, if you want to close us out with these kind of yeah. maybe three postures we can take. And really to think about how do we get this from something that we know and talk about into our hearts and into our actions. So would encourage you uh, in, in the next couple of days to really think about where am I tempted to do that us versus them. Maybe it's not an issue of race or sex, but maybe it is ideological. It becomes political. Where do you get tempted to us versus them? The second is then to truly pray, Jesus, would you convict me in those moments when I want to disengage from that diversity and I don't want to lean in and have a posture towards the other. And then finally, do something. Whether that's I'm going to take a friend to coffee that I know, like, we, we have, like, concrete differences. Whether that's, again, the posture of humility of asking for forgiveness and, a, and an interaction that hasn't been healthy. But really encouraging you to actually do something with this idea uh, and not let it just stay kind of in your head or in your heart. So, uh, Father, would you help us? Um, we want to be people who are really a city on a hill who are different than the world. And so would you help us? Would you continue to transform us? Um, by the way that you've given up all power and authority and resource. And would you, would you call us to do that for one another? Help our community um, in these coming days as we have these conversations. God, would you help us to do that well, um, to say things, to mess up, but to commit to one another as you've committed to us. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great weekend.